Good evening to everyone. Welcome to another night of study in the Word of God. We have an exciting study for you tonight. And I'm going to be going right into the Word. Uh, I need you to grab your Bibles or your cell phones or whatever it is that you use to get the Word of God. We're going to continue and pick up the study. I'm going right in because i got an exciting thing to talk about tonight. Controversial. Uh, there's going to be all kinds of schools of thought. Matter of fact, I have to give me a great big Bible so I can make sure I know what I'm talking about. Okay, we're going to have that there. So let me have a word of prayer, then we're going right into the word of God. Will you bow with me, please? God, in your own wisdom and in your plan for our life, we ask, Lord, that this teaching line up with your will. That everything that is said and done leads us closer to you and our walk in the kingdom. Lord, let someone who now, Lord, is anxious or has something going on in their mind that they need to deal with, let it come to the forefront because this teaching is perfect for bringing us face to face with the reality of who you are. So I thank you tonight, God, as we go, Lord, I ask you to refresh my mind, let everyone know it's a privilege to study the word of God. It is an awesome, awesome, awesome honor to be able to know that the words we're looking at and reading and speaking are, is your word. And it's a word that can change our lives and make us what you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're picking up the teaching on from the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached, chapters 5 through 7 of the book of Matthew. Here's what happened. We found out talking about the kingdom of God that Jesus came Fulfilled the scripture. We've been there. And then he told us about the kingdom of God. And he taught all this cool stuff we got in the kingdom. Uh, I mean, we can bind and loose. Uh, we got the Lord's Prayer. We got all this power we can say. And then we found out something that you just can't have this power without also having character. Wow. Did you know there's usually two people in every one person? Uh huh. There, there's a person you see, and then there's that behind the door secret person. It's that person that does things that, you know, that aren't what they represent on the outside. Come on, all of us know there's two of us, and at any given point in time, we're trying to bring them together so we can control what we do in the Lord. What we're going to talk about tonight is, as you can see, marriage, divorce, and the caveat, those two little lines down there, remarriage. So grab somebody. I'm going to give you the Bible lowdown on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. But first, see how this fits into our teaching. Jesus has said, you can't just have an outward show. Scribes and Pharisees have been coming and actually leading people religiously, making sure they were legal enough for the behavior, but their heart wasn't right. Legal enough for the behavior. You know what I'm talking about. You know, there's a lot of us who can act Christian, act real churchy, but man, I sure would not want to live with them. I sure would. Here's the thing. Even though all of us on the outside don't get to see that other person you are, two things you need to understand. First of all, God is not mocked. He knows the real you. So you got to figure out you can't fool God. And so if you're trying to fool us, you'll get away with it. But you can't fool God. So how do I make myself what I know I should be and not just on the outside? We can have someone in our churches who could be an axe murderer. Come on. And we don't know that because when they're around us, they're smiling. You know how you look at television and that guy who was a nice guy cutting his grass next door is being taken away in handcuffs and you found out he got some kids chained in the basement, something crazy. It's because our outside behavior does not allow us to walk in the kingdom. You better hear me tonight. Uh, one of my greatest heroes growing up was Bill Cosby. Any African-American, male or female, Bill Cosby was the first. He was handsome. He was funny. He was acting in major television. He was winning, to he was winning awards on television. And we said, man, Dr. Cosby, everything he touched turned to gold. Except he didn't have the character to go with it. So as I go into this teaching tonight, 
You already talked about murder, how when you're angry, you're a murderer. We talked last week about lust, how lust is not just, uh, lust and adultery is not just when you actually touch someone, but when you actually create that in your heart. God looks at that heart part of us. So if you want to walk successfully in the kingdom of God, here we're going to tell you something. You're not fooling anybody. You need to change. Listen to the word of God tonight because we're starting on a topic that is instrumental in helping us become what God wants us to become. Meaning that no matter how you try to hide that other person, there's somebody that knows it. Your spouse. Wow. They see the real you. Because marriage is tough. So tonight we're going to look at and pick up these principles. So Sermon on the Mount went to Beatitudes. We talked about those. Then it talked about uh, our actions, the salt in the light. That you know we ought to be the salt of the earth, the light. Then we talked about a few of the principles. So now after getting through the, we're, we're dealing now with our character that has to be more righteous than the Pharisees more righteous, I guarantee you, as righteous as you are, it may not be good enough for you to get the things you want from God until you understand the reality of your character. So let's talk about this tonight. Let's talk about marriage and divorce. Are you with me? So first of all, Matthew 5, 31 to 32. Let's look at it. It was also said Remember that the process of this text is, it always starts with, it was said, but I said. Man, all Jesus is saying is, there's a lot of religious stuff out there, but this is what I say if you really want to get the power. You can act religious, but on the inside, you'll never get the benefits of the kingdom until you know what he says. So let's get to the topic. It was also said, whosoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorcement. A written divorce, a bill of divorce, uh, papers, certain with papers. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. The word is clear, or is it? There is so much confusion on this teaching. And there's so many, so much bias on this teaching. Some of us have been saved so long. We're not living, but we sure like to judge other people. So we made our own judgments about this. They will live and die. I'm talking about Christians with veins in the necks telling you what's right and wrong. And they have not did a study in the Word to understand any scripture. Hear me, Bible readers. You must know the context, then the application as it comes to us. So we can't just slide it into us without understanding what it's really saying to us and what Jesus is saying to the audience that he's talking to. What am I saying? Is that to interpret these verses correctly, we have to see what Jesus is saying and the implications for us. And we have to look in three areas. We're going to look at marriage, what God says about it. We're going to look at divorce, what the Bible says about it. It's a sermon on now. And we're going to look at that tricky subject called remarriage. By the way, I'll throw this in so that you follow me. I, I get this question all the time. If I had two spouses, which one am I going to be with in heaven? Wow. Do I even want to be with one of them in heaven? Maybe I want another spouse. I don't know. But the reality is we're going to talk about what the Bible says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, what does the Bible say about it? Not what you say, not what your uncle told you, not what you grew up hearing in the church. Let's look at what Jesus said because he's now trying to correct the Pharisees, like some of us, who now say, well, I'm right because I'm legal. Uh, but your heart's not right. See, they, they just wanted to correct themselves to the point that they were following whatever the interpretation was, but they didn't care who they hurt. They didn't care what they said as long as they can say, but I'm doing what the law says. And many of us have turned into Christians like that, where we're quick to judge. And no, we got a shadow of a doubt. Hands in the air. All of us know we're not even living right. There's things we're wrestling with. So watch this. How do we deal with this? But I want all my folks to, 
to, to catch this. Take it on its own. Uh, Jesus seems to be stating the rule that it was wrong to get divorced in any case except when a spouse has cheated. But when we put this text in proper context, we find out that is not what Jesus was saying. Remember when Jesus says, you have heard it said. I told you about that. He is also distinguishing again between the righteousness in the kingdom of God and what is, what is uh, uh, the righteousness of Christianity or of religious people. And he's given a statement. So he wants us to know how do we correct our world living the way he wants us to live. So first of all, let's look at why this is so important that we tackle marriage and divorce. First of all, marriage has changed in our society. The Marion Webster Dictionary, the online dictionary, tells us that I found three basic definitions of marriage. And I want you to see them. One, the relationship that exists between a husband and a wife. That's basically the Bible definition. A similar relationship between people of the same sex. This is what marriage has gotten to in our society. This is where marriage is. The third thing is a ceremony in which two people are married to each other. They went as far as leaving anything that God said in our postmodern world, in a world where we have interpret, interpreted religious tolerance, we now cannot speak out against marriage in any form. Now, I'm not going there tonight. I may do another time. I'm not here trying to you know, slur out and tell folks. I knew those Christian folks were going to say that. Here is what I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. But we have three states of marriage. So Jesus was saying, I'm trying to get you to understand what it means to be righteous. And he's correct because our world has gone off now. Three states. Marriage between a husband and wife. A relationship between people of the same sex. Then they say, look, we can just be even bigger than that and just say it's uh, two people who are married to each other. And in that context of marriage, they're talking about even people who live together. And then it tells us Americans are no longer putting a ring on. The U.S. marriage rate fell to its lowest level in 2018. Get out of the way. Federal stats released Wednesday, and this was back when it was released in 2018, showed that, this, new figures from the National Center of Health Statistics reveal nationwide marriage rate fell 6% from 2017-2018 with 6.5 new unions formed for every 1,000 people. Yep. Watch this, gentlemen. Watch this, ladies. Out of every 1,000 people, there were only 6.5 new unions. Where did they get the five from? I don't know. But I'm just letting you know, there is not, for their marriage has just dropped by 6%. Um, and it's the lowest we've ever had. Millennials are in peak marriage years between their 20s and 30s. And it's still dropping. Uh, Curtin, who is the author of this article, told the newspaper this, this is historic because millennials are no longer getting married right away. Uh, the age for being married used to be 24, 25, maybe you got it 28, 29. Millennials are saying, I'm going to graduate, I'm going to give me a check, I'm going to give me a crib, I'm going to give me a car. They want to get all their own stuff. Then they say, now I might get married, but I'm going to have my own. So they've left the spirit of what God said marriage is, and that's where we are right now. Uh, divorce rates, national divorce rates. 33% of those getting married have had at least one divorce rate. That's high. Out of 100 people that get married, 33 of them experience at least one divorce. That is high. Now, I know we used to say, well, Christian Ray, that there was a number out saying 50%. Well, it's not that any longer, and I'm going to explain to you why, because there's a caveat you need to see. The first thing is, in 2008, the Barnard Group found that born again Christians were indistinguishable from the national average, no matter the, the divorce rate was. We're at 33% also. So, let me get this straight. Christians who are supposed to practice love, forgiveness, and everything else, we're still talking about marriage, please give, indulge me right here so you can understand why I tell you the hardest thing you're going to do when God gets on the Sermon on the Mount is figure out 
how to have that righteous heart long enough to live in a union that God has stated. Divorce with 30% having got married and divorce at least one time. Christians, and it varies between, you know, different denominations, but I didn't get into that. It varies between uh, different races and socioeconomic groups. I didn't get into that. But what you need to understand is this is the hard and fast rule. When it was 50, we were keeping up. When it's 33, we're keeping up. Which lets me know Christians still live by the values of the world. Almost there. Among all born-again Christians, the divorce figure is 32%, which is statistically identical to the 33 figure among non-born-again adults. The research is clear. We, should, we do need God's righteousness. We do need to be practicing what God told us to do. Now, in full disclosure, when I was researching this, you can read this yourself, there's several updates. Those updates take into consideration that people just aren't getting better. It takes into consideration that people are cohabitating, and it's considered normal. Uh, it takes into consideration that our general population does no longer think divorce is a big deal. Um, matter of fact, divorce is a rite of passage. If I marry you and you don't act right, I need to get out so I can be happy. If I marry you and I'm mad at you for at least three days, we done. That's what marriage has been reduced to. I want to show you the eight common reasons for divorce. I'm trying to say what the world says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, right? Now, then we're going to get into what Jesus said. So watch this. The eight most common reasons uh, for divorce, according to lifestyle research, lack of commitment. I thought when you got married, you got married to be committed. You know why you did? Because commitment is hard. Can I tell you something else about commitment? It takes two people. And if you're the one trying to be committed and the other person isn't, it's hard to hold on to a relationship. Yeah. Too much arguing. We argue too much. How many of y'all know out there, hands raised up, if arguing was the barometer by which I got a divorce, I would have had two, three, four of them. Because arguing happens. God knew we were going to argue. But come on, right now, you just had an argument with your spouse right now. Over dinner. I don't know what it is. But if arguing was the reason we could just get a divorce, a whole lot of us would be divorced right now. Marrying too young. An excuse. They say, I married too young. I didn't know what I was getting into. So they say, I got to get out of this one so I can get into another one. Another excuse. Unrealistic expectations. They go into a marriage thinking everything going to be just fine. The fairy tale. Very seldom is anybody marriage a fairy tale. No, a lot of times you kiss the frog. Infidelity. Lack of equality. Infidelity is one, is one is biblical, but God is saying we just aren't, that goes back to the commitment. We just are not committed. Lack of equality. We think we get into a marriage, everybody's supposed to be equal, so you got a husband and wife vying for power. So day after day, all they're doing is fighting to see who's on top, and all of a sudden it creates a divorce. Abuse. And of course, the Bible does not address directly divorce, I mean abuse, but I tell anyone who comes to my council, if somebody hits you, get out. We'll find the scriptures for it later. Leave. Now, let's talk about the Bible's teaching. If your position is going to get you, grab yours. Watch this. Sadly, divorce and remarriage are widespread realities in the Bible of Christ. Generally speaking, Christians tend to fall into one of four positions. Now, this is funny to me. We will argue about some things that we're not even fulfilling ourselves. Watch this. Find your position for me. First of all, no divorce. No remarriage. Marriage is a covenant agreement meant for life. Therefore, it must not be broken under any circumstances. Marriage, remarriage further violates the covenant and therefore is not permissible. We are saying that there is um, supposed to be no marriage. They got some people like that. No marriage, no um, remarriage. They're telling you I'm, I'm covering up the screen there. Yeah. All right. The second position, maybe that's yours. Divorce but no remarriage. Okay. So I'm, I've been, I want to be with somebody, but I got divorced. Now I can't remarry. What do I do with my life? Watch this. Here's the position. Divorce, while not God's desire, is sometimes the only alternative 
when all else has failed, the divorced person must remain unmarried for life thereafter. That's crazy. That's what people say. There's a lot of Christians that will tell you, you can't get remarried, they'll kick you off the deacon board. Third one is, but remarriage only in certain situations. Divorce, while not God's desire, is sometimes unavoidable. If the grounds for the divorce are biblical, the divorced person can remarry, but only to another believer. That sounds pretty good. Let's go to the next one, next position. Divorce and remarriage. Divorce, while not God's desire, is not an unforgivable sin. That's true. But it's not to be clicking. It's not to be something you dangle around and live off of it. That again goes to the deceit of your heart. Right? Um, regardless of the circumstances, all divorced persons who have repented should be forgiven and allowed to remarry. Those last two are hitting on some of the biblical truth. Are you ready to get to this text that Jesus said? I kind of set it up for you so you know what, what the Bible says about divorce and remarriage. What was he saying? How do I walk in the kingdom? How do I know what I'm doing is okay so I can sleep at night so I know I won't go to hell? Uh, side commercial. There's a whole lot of saints who have interpreted this stuff, living by stuff, brought other people into their mess, and now they're going to hell and they're taking other people. Just because you say you're saved, it's not, it's not good enough. You have to have a heart that is crying, hungering to do what the word of God says. That's why when you're in a marriage, sometimes you can feel miserable. But you will pray, and God can bring you back, and you will stay there because God says so. So watch this. If I said, you don't make marriage sound too appetizing here. Get ready to do it. Stay with me. The Bible does not, this is where I may lose some theologians. Stay with me. The Bible does not command divorce, but it permits, regulates, and limits divorce. I'm going to say it again. Please understand. The Bible allows divorce in certain situations. You can't deny that. Some people understand that. But some people get to the point where that's cool, but what about the rematch? I want to tell you about that. If the Bible permits, watch this, Malachi 2.16. That's the verse everyone uses to say God hates marriage. But read the text. He hates marriage. Well, look what the text says. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Now understand, God is saying the essence of what this verse in Matthew 5 will say. I'm slowing down so you can catch up with me. Look at these words again. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect. Let's figure this out. So Jesus is interpreting, I don't know what happened there, Jesus is interpreting the kingdom uh, of principles based on righteousness. Oh, there we go. We need to understand things in these verses to get the heart, to get to the heart of the teaching. Here we go. First they said, so the text, Matthew 5 says, you have also heard it said. Everybody with me? You've also heard it said. Okay? So we got to figure out who are they that said it. How did the teaching get to the point of what divorce and remarriage was in biblical time? How did in Jesus' day, how did they interpret it? How did Jesus know what to talk about unless he understood the contemporary ideals during first century Judaism about marriage. What am I saying? Jesus is talking about something that God made. God made marriage, not us. So follow this. He said, first, they, who are they? Jesus was talking about the current schools of thought on divorce in his day and what they were based on. All right? So, Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. Go there. This is the verse that the Jews based their understanding of marriage and divorce on. Let me read the text. Read it and watch what Jesus says. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. 
This is so powerful. First of all, this is a society where women have no power. They have no voice. They can't go out and work. If a woman is sent from a man's house, two things happen. She either going to be a prostitute or she's going to be an adulteress. Because when she leaves the house, she has no means in society to do any work herself. So what, what this is saying is, unless they find something indecent, we're going to look at that. Because there was two schools of thought. They had watered down the scripture so badly that people were divorcing their wife for anything. And then Jesus came along and said, let me clarify this for you. So understand it. In Jesus' day, many people interpreted the most safe permission for divorce, the verse we just read, read, stay with me, granting virtually any reason for the grounds of divorce. Some rabbis that taught even extended to the fact that if a woman burnt her husband's breakfast, he could put her out. True. Jesus came along looking at the selfishness of all of this. How many know we would have put our wife out, get her burnt something, go, go, you're out. First century Jews had three sacred documents. Come on, this is where you get into the text behind the text so you understand. They had three documents that made up their religious life. So when Jesus came along, he said, you heard what they said. Now let me tell you what the kingdom of God says so you know how to walk. Please my father, walk in the rights of the kingdom, understanding what the kingdom is saying. First, they had the Torah. That word Torah just means it was the Jewish law. Whenever you hear the law and the prophets, it is the Torah. That makes up the whole Jewish law. Then they had the Talmud. The Talmud is Jewish theology. That was where the rabbis got all of their understanding of, the, of religion. Um, what they were sacred, the Sabbath was sacred, what you can do on the Sabbath. That all came from religious writing, right? And then they had the Mishnah. The Mishnah was the oral traditions and customs. Here's where we got a problem. You know how two people tell a story, two people see the same thing, and they tell a story, and when they tell the story, the story gets off? Because what happened with the Mishnah is oral tradition kept going down, and that's why you had scribes and Pharisees and Essenes, and you had all these religious orders because of the fact they couldn't agree what they were interpreting. So, here's the whole, there was three actual sacred doctrine, doctrines that led us to the teaching on divorce. These documents were interpreted by rabbis of Jewish or Jewish scholars. Here's where we get into it. There were two schools of thought, or two main rabbis, that actually were the ones who taught the traditions about divorce. Several things they argued about, but these are the two main uh, rabbis or Jewish scholars that did, made up the writings. The house of Shema, those who adopted a strict interpretation thought that something indecent meant adultery alone and justified a divorce. Watch this, guys. They said the heart of Jesus is you are not that trivial where you just kick somebody out for anything. The first school of thought was the house of Shema. The second school of thought was the house of Hillel. Now, what's important about this, those who adopted the loose interpretation that something indecent could be anything a man thought of were the ones running rampant in Jesus' day. They were the ones controlling divorce. They were the ones who were making a sham out of the righteousness of your heart. In looking at divorce, most of the religious leaders believe the loose interpretation. Wow. They said, no, a man can put his wife out no matter what. Let me show you some of the reasons you put your wife out. If she gave him a bad reputation, if she burned his toe, if she didn't give him children, if she let his food spoil, bad meat, didn't clean the refrigerator out, look at your new, look at your new husband. If she let herself go visit, if she went in public with her hair not done, they, woo, I know somebody be divorced right now. Went in public and didn't have your head rag on. Those are the things. Isn't that silly? They were making a mockery. You know, I'm being a little flippant, but they were making a mockery out of something that God said. Allow husbands to dis discard their wives at will, leading to them being legal by behavior, but not the heart. I gotta stay there for a minute. Quit fooling yourself when you keep saying, but I'm following the Bible. 
But I'm trying the best I can. All you're doing is justifying being legal, but you're not allowing God to touch your heart. Your heart is what has to be touched. So what did Jesus teach? Follow this. What did Jesus teach? So we saw what they said. But to develop a kingdom of God perspective on divorce and remarriage in the church, let's look at what Jesus taught on this subject. Let me read that for a minute. So you have these two Jewish scholars, Shema and Hillel. They're telling everybody they've interpreted the Talmud, they've interpreted the Mishnah, they've given down the oral tradition, and now you have when Jesus came, women were running around, left out, no food, and they had no choice but to be prostitutes. So Jesus came along, watch this, and we had to go to Matthew chapter 19 to find out what happened. Because most of the rabbis came to Jesus and they wanted to see if Jesus agreed with them. So how do we find out what Jesus taught to give us some extra biblical understanding of what he said the kingdom was? I want you to go with me to Matthew 19. I'm going to read it. Matthew 19. So, if I look at it, if you're there, say amen. Amen. All right. We'll start at verse... Start at verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, tempting him, come on, read with him, tempting him, saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? See, they were doing it. They wanted Jesus to justify. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that which he made from the beginning? He made them male and female. He said, Don't you remember what God said? And they said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two Wherefore, they are no more two, but flesh. What God is doing together, let no man put asunder. Please understand that. They came back to Jesus, verse 7. They said unto him, Well, why did Moses command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away then. Jesus came back at them and said, Moses only did that because of the hardness of your hearts. He suffered you to put your wife away, but it was not so from the beginning. Perfect teaching. From the beginning, no Christian who is trying to live by this and understanding, but God knows we're human. So I'm getting there. There, there is definitely as I said at the beginning of this teaching, the Bible is going to show us where they live it and allow only because as humans we mess up. I know Malachi says God hates divorce. There's a lot of stuff God hates that, you're, that we're doing. So it still doesn't preclude us from doing them. We still do them. So does that mean that it's, still, is it, it's the worst thing in the world? No. we got to repent and we got to straighten up and we got to find the word of God and do better in our heart and take it seriously. So Jesus said, no. It wasn't like that from the beginning. And watch this. And I say unto you, he said, let me settle this for you. Whosoever shall put his wife away, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery. Whoso marrieth her, which is put away, also commits adultery. Let me explain it to you. In this cultural context, that was Jesus approached by a group of Pharisees who came to him in this incident we just read about, some Pharisees came and is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Basically they were asking him, do you adopt our loose interpretation? And then Jesus said, only for, I gotta go back, only for the sake of, only for the sake of something indecent or sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, write this down, is where we get our word pornea. It's where the word pornographic comes from. P-O-R-N-E-A. So the word pornea, Jesus was saying, unless it's for some illicit sexual act. And then he gave an example. What is that illicit sexual act? It goes back to the holiness code, exhaustively itemized, prohibited forms of sexuality. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 20. And here's what Jesus was referring to when he said the holiness code, that there was a code of holiness that Jesus referred to in the beginning of, of the Bible that was referred to by God. And listen to what it says about sexuality. Go to Leviticus chapter 20. Come on, we're going to study some Bible. Now. Leviticus chapter 20. Go with me for a minute. And we're going to start at verse 10. 
If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are put to death. If a man has sexual relations with his father's wife, he has disabled his father. Both the man and the woman are to be put to death. The blood will be on their head. If a man has sexual relations with his daughter-in-law, both of them are to be put to death. What they have done is a perversion. Their blood will be on their head. If a man has sexual relations with another man, like he would a woman, here in the Bible, both of them have done the detestable. They are to be put to death. If a man marries a woman, both the woman and her mother, it is wicked. Both of them must be burned. If a man, verse 15, has sexual relations with an animal, it must be put, he must be put to death. If a woman approaches an animal to have sexual relations, verse 17, if a man has relations with a sister, so here's what I'm trying to tell you. Jesus said, except for, follow it, except for adultery or indiscretion or sexual immorality, which is the word for Nia, which takes us back to what God calls holiness, which what I just read to you in Leviticus. Here are the reasons, not the reasons, here are the exceptions. Here is what God says that takes away the marriage. Here is what God says that brings in a right for divorce. I don't want to keep saying a right because the people are saying it should never be divorced. Here's what God's saying when he talks about that sexual immorality. Here's what Jesus is saying so you understand it. He's saying here are some reasons that can be acted upon if you're in a marriage. And when you see the word death, it means that the marriage has been severed. How do I know? Because the key word in that above passage is the word pornea, translated as sexual immorality. Now, I just read to you, the word has a range of meanings, but almost certainly a reference of the entirety of the holiness code as recorded in, in Leviticus. Thus, by Cornelia, we can safely conclude Jesus considered, watch this, y'all, adultery, homosexuality, sex, incest, bestiality, as con constituting grounds for a divorce. Understand telling you, Jesus said, look, you just can't put people away from anybody. You've got to give them a writing of divorce. So let's get to your argument, because I can hear it coming back at me. Watch this. The Apostle Paul added another exception in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if we read that text, we got to read it, so you stay with me. He also says, abandon me. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Oh, that's why I got the big old Bible here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want you to go there with me. So God has a standard of holiness that when broken, all right, so we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the things you wrote me, it is not, that's not the verse of 1. Oh, here it is. Oh, here it is. So go with me and start reading at verse 12. But to the rest be I, not the Lord, if a brother has a wife that believeth not, you're married, but you're married to an unbeliever, and she pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And if a woman has a husband that believes not, and she want to dwell with him, don't put him away. Verse 13, go with me. For the unbelieving is sanctified by the believing one. But, verse 15, if the, the believing depart, let them depart. A brother or sister in such cases, for God has called to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether or not thou shalt save thy husband, or knowest thou, O uh, man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But if God has the spirit to every man, the Lord has called upon one of us so to walk in him. Here's what God is saying. If you abandon me and you don't want to stay because you don't want to serve God. I didn't say this. Apostle Paul said it. I'm trying to serve the Lord. You want to leave me because you don't want to be a believer. I'm to let you leave. 
If you're not a believer and you want to stay with me, I'm going to stay with you. I, I pray for you. I let you stay with me. I go to church. You go to, you go to shop right. I don't care where you go. We, as long as you are trying to live the life, we can stay married. But once you leave me and abandon me and you go out, probably, again, committing a sexual immorality, I am free to receive a divorce if you have abandoned me. Watch this. So, her husband has committed adultery with it. Okay, let's, let's look at these reasons again. The biblical grounds for divorce, based on the passages we read, uh, we can say with confidence that a believer may initiate divorce in the following cases. Now listen to me. Don't say Pastor Douglas is advocating divorce. I'm telling you how to stay in the bounds of the Bible when it comes to that divorce and understand where you are in your life. And it was God's code. Jesus said this, and he came on the scene, he said, except for sexual immorality. So then he explained sexual immorality in Leviticus, and he gave us all of these reasons. Based on that passage, if her husband has committed adultery, and you know the Bible was written again in a male gender, but it means man or woman has committed adultery with another man's wife or husband, her husband has homosexual sex with another man, her husband has sex with an animal, bestiality, her husband has had sex with a relative, her husband no longer wishes to be married to her because of her Christian faith. If my faith is running you away from me, you have abandoned me, and that is a ground. Any of the five cases above, a believer when, when divorce is pursued. Now, I, I probably should not have written the word pursue divorce, because there is no reason for divorce. But what I'm trying to share with you, Jesus was trying to get them to say, you got to follow the word of God, and you got to make sure there is a writing of divorce. Here's what, we, here's what we're missing. So Jesus came. Pharisees, start Pharisees came to him. Can you put a red woman for any cause? He said, no. Follow the law and accept the sexual morality. Here's why. A writing of divorcement or a bill of divorcement. Watch this point because it's important for all y'all saying, everybody out there saying, um, God don't want you to get remarried. Now we know it's not the unforgivable sin, but I want to take you to another level of freedom. Here's what the Bible says. A bill of divorcement freeing the woman to be remarried legally. If I kick you out and I don't give you a bill of divorcement, a biblical bill of divorcement meant that you are still following the law. You're still among the, the, you're still proper in the house of God. You still are within bounds to be a free woman. But if I put you out for any kind of reason, remember what I told you, Jesus was trying to protect the woman. You can't work, you can't eat, you can't buy property. So what would you be? You would then be putting her out, making her turn into an adulteress. And whoever married that woman, who was not giving a bill of divorcement, a reason legally in the Bible also committed adultery. Do you get it? Just by the virtue of the fact that the Bible says that if my wife commits adultery, I can divorce her, wouldn't it go to say that the same fact is I am also free to be remarried? The same virtue. It, it doesn't make sense to say I'm okay with the scripture, but I can't remarry. It's not true. Now, Someone asked me, so I might as well bridge this question right now. When we get to heaven, the love in heaven is so much higher than the love on earth. We don't like to talk about when someone says there is no giving and taking of marriage in heaven. What the scripture is saying is that we want to think earthly. God is thinking heavenly. When we get to heaven, yes, you will still know your spouse. But the kind of erotic love, the kind of love we depend on down here, why did God make that? Procreate. To make sure you stay away from adultery and sexual temptation and fornication. To make sure that you procreate the world and to make sure that there could be a family. When you get to heaven, there won't be any of that. Because when we get to heaven, there'll be no death. So why would there be marriage in heaven when the reasons for marriage in God's constitution was for us to procreate? was for us to make sure we ain't got sexual infidelity, all that we go. We'll be given a different body when we get to heaven. Yes, I will still know Marcia. Yes, she will still know us. But here is what you're missing. The love that we have in heaven is going to be higher than the love we have on earth. We're going to be back in that perfect love of God. So quit trying to bring earthly stuff into a heavenly realm and make that your only reason. You're reading a text, but you're not reading the text to understand how it is interpreted for what God said. God is saying, you made that woman an adulterer because you didn't put her out right. You didn't give her a bill of divorce. You didn't divorce her for 
for something that was written in the scripture. You just put it out. You just left because you weren't happy. You left because you don't like it, don't like it no more. You left. No, God said, no, now you're wrong. The only way you get your heart right with God is to make sure you line yourself back up to the scripture. A woman had no rights. So she would have to prostitute or be with any man who would take her. If he let her go wrongfully, she had no choice but to come in the darkness. No, no other way you can figure that. No other way in the text. You've got to understand it. Now, that's not what's happening in our day. Jesus is now teaching us how to walk in the kingdom. So he said, let me settle this matter. Unless the person has committed a sexual act that constitutes one of the ones I just shared with you in Leviticus. Remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law. So everything that took into consideration what God has said. So here's what he said. That right now, sexual immorality was a reason for divorce. And if I had a reason for divorce, when God said it's not good for man to be alone, but when God said we, we broke our covenant, now God has healed me. Now I'm going to stay on this. Every man and woman is to fight through Christian scripture of forgiveness and love and fight for that covenant. So please don't act like I'm negating that. But you quit living in a fairy tale world that people don't have problems. We're trying to get them to line up with what the word of God says. What is God saying? Not what some man has said. There are people running around right now passing judgment on other people. I know a preacher who said nobody could remarry. He would not do any second marriages. Call me up, want me to do the second marriages until he got divorced. Oh, now it's okay. That's where we are. That's the kind of people we are. We have to know that every day we're being scrutinized. This stuff in the Sermon on the Mount, man, that's some high stuff to live by. Either you're going to give the world the truth, or you're going to sit there and try to judge them on something that you can't even live by. And I, I like the old saying, watch, you know, watch who you're kicking on your way up. You might see the same book on your way down. I mean, you talk about them now, it might be you one day. So what about rematch? Here we go. When the Bible permits divorce, it is so that the wronged or abandoned party may remarry. That's what a certificate of divorce is. Go back, I defy you, and research a bill of divorcement, a writing of divorcement, and you'll see that's what it was for. So the person can leave whole and intact and not get tangled up in adultery and being left out into society. So it was permissible for the abandoned party. Jesus said, I'm going to give you some scriptures to back up what I'm saying. Matthew 5, 31, it was also said, wherever the divorce is like, Jesus said it in our text today. He said, sexual immorality. He pulled it all together. So, I'm not telling anybody to get divorced. I'm telling you to forgive somebody. God told, when we look at our text, we know that um, God told the prophet to forgive his wife, and she was a prostitute. He said, I want you to stay with her because it was showing the union between Christ and his church. I left that one out when I was talking about what marriage signifies. The union between Christ and his church. So when we get to heaven, that union will be fulfilled. So think about how God, who is way, way smarter than us, understands and gives us an understanding about marriage and divorce. I still say, brother, who buys to give me back? That's because you still want to do it. Jesus said. That's all we can look at. Jesus is simply saying that if the divorce is not legitimate, then the remarriage is not legitimate. If the divorce is legitimate, he uses pornea again, the remarriage is legitimate. And that's why you want to divorce him. I said, they don't even know who they're going to be with in heaven. I just explained that to you. So we don't have to worry about that. Similarly, the Apostle Paul says in Corinthians 7, that if the unbelieving spouse does not want to stay in the marriage, does not want to live with an active and obvious Christian, then the believer should let them go. In such cases, the believer is not bound and they are free to remarry. My unbelieving spouse said, I don't want to serve your God. You're trying to make me choose God over staying single forever. That's not what the Bible says. The pillar 
commentary of Corinthians makes this point clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. To the rest I say, not I the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is unbeliever and she consents, I, I read that too. So that's talking about the abandonment. Right? So, Matthew 5, 33, 37, again you have heard that it was said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform to oath. That's going into the oath. So let's back up and go back to the marriage piece that we can settle this. So, the bottom line to all of this is, the scribes and Pharisees came to Christ. What do you think? Can I put my wife away for anything? The result was no. Except for the cause of fornication. I'm giving you this after we all are taking um, as a prerequisite that we have followed everything God said about forgiveness and about love and about staying in marriage and about doing the best I can and fighting through it. I'm saying once you get to that point, that is make sure you're lined up with the scripture. Marriage. Two become one. They should not separate. Divorce, just gave you the reason why. Remarriage, if the bill of divorcement is correct, then remarriage. So when you say, you're going to be an adulterer, you're trying to make old Bible times come into now when a woman can go out and work and do what they need to do. So it's not the same thing. Quit trying to put people in bondage. So Jesus came and gave the only reason for divorce. He said, Pastor, you gave a lot of them. No, I did. I gave one. And I gave the categories of different sexual uh, indiscretions. One, Jesus said, let me say it. If there is adultery, fornication, or sexual, um, talk about it if you need to. Um, I need you to write me with questions. If you have questions, because we're getting ready to continue this Sermon on the Mount. It is so awesome. And again, remember, this teaching on righteousness is us lining our heart up with God. So I tell anybody out there struggling with marriage, fight for your marriage. And I'm telling anybody out there who is going through a divorce, you need to recheck and make sure it is proper. The Bible does not tell us in any shape or form to get married. God hates divorce. But God also hates other stuff. Let's fight to be what God said. So Jesus came. Stop the shenanigans of just divorcing all over the place. And said, this is the only reason I Sin. Amen? Hope somebody got something out of that teaching tonight. Um, there's somebody here listening. You've been struggling and maybe you left your marriage wrong. You've been struggling because maybe you're shacking up and you're trying to be you're a believer, you're trying to serve Christ. I'm only being honest. Maybe every now and then you slip and fornicate. Again, being honest. We in the church sometimes aren't realistic. There are people in the church who are fighting and struggling the same sexual battles. Jesus Christ is very practical. With the help of the Holy Spirit, you can surround yourself with enough love and forgiveness, you and your partner, that you can stay together forever. But you've heard people say this, I love you, but sometimes I don't like you. That's where we got to change our heart. So tonight, I want to pray for marriages. I want to pray for a person who wants to be married again, who maybe the church told they couldn't be. That's between you and God. I want to pray for someone who's feeling so bad because they tried it over and over and over and over again, and it just didn't work. I want to pray for someone who's been in a bad marriage for years. I want to pray you have continued strength in God because you've been serving God by trying to keep that marriage together. Let's pray tonight. You bow with me. Father God, one of the hardest things in our character is to let the person we are on the inside, that person that is connected to the light of God through the Holy Ghost, to let that person reign on the outside and not try to cut corners by just being a good religious person or a good Christian in the church but knowing that our heart is just not right. Lord, I pray for those who are widowed and lost their loved one. And someone told them that their life was over. No, God, you set them free. I pray
Pray for someone who was abandoned. And they're still trying to serve you. And they don't want to fornicate. No, God, you told them their life is free. I pray for someone who wants a spouse but won't bring their body under control. I pray that they learn to do so. Lord, now I pray for a spirit of happiness. The spouses learn to talk to each other with love. And there be joy in the response. Love that brought them together rule within that house. I pray that children see mothers and fathers in love and there'll be a loving atmosphere in every home. I pray that your spirit reigns supreme. Lord, I pray we don't have to think about the force. But Lord, you made preparation in your word for us to continue following you. Sin is not in falling down. Sin is when we don't get back up. But I thank you for your spirit tonight. If there's someone who needs you as Savior, please repeat these words after me. Please, if you're listening to this prayer, say this. Say, Lord God, I am a sinner. I know that you died on the cross for my sins. I've been running. I've tried other things. But now, God, I need help. So I confess with my mouth. I give you my heart because I trust and believe that you rose with all power in your hand. And say this loud, I am saved. Jesus is Lord. Come on, give God praise everywhere in your house, wherever you are. I pray this teacher that does some good. Don't forget, next week, we're going to look at the whole thing about swearing. We're going to go into the Lord's Prayer. It's going to be awesome to see the rest of the character points in the Word of God. Remember, if you want to contribute to this ministry, just go to our website. Um, we are a ministry that is still active, doing the will of God. Everybody have a great night. This is Pastor Duncan saying, see you Sunday morning, 10 o'clock live. God bless you.